So Adam, thank you so much for joining us on the show. All right. Thank you so much, Charlie, for having me. Really appreciate it. So you're an attorney. You have a nonprofit organization. You are involved in Hatsala, which is a volunteer ambulance corps, um, and probably many other things that you're involved in. Is that somewhat correct? That is correct. Teaching, birthright trips, Jay Inspire, you know, boards of various organizations. You don't stop. There's never, I, I would bet you that there's never a minute where you're like, I am totally bored. Do you ever have that feeling? No, actually that happens a lot. Oh yeah, it does? That's, that's going to be the shocker of the interview, Charlie. Yeah. So. so let's talk about that because when, when I looked at your uh, resume, when I looked at the, the bio that I just read, um, I was exhausted reading your bio. And I know there's still only 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, and one day you get off. So just like overarching, how do you approach time management? So I think that uh, for many people, especially uh, people that have full-time jobs, their job really becomes something that's almost all-consuming, at least during work hours, but unfortunately today, very often after work hours as well. Um, one of the, the very, you know, sort of dark sides of the pandemic that you hear people talking about a lot uh, is the fact that there's no more line between work and home and personal life, right. uh, you know, it's just you're at home all the time and home is work and work is home and there isn't even an office to go to to make that delineation but the truth is that it started way before then because you know with advent of smartphones people are reachable all the time and i think that that blurs the lines uh, a lot and so i think that you know the first thing that i have to say about time management uh, but without talking about business structure and how i structured my business and i'd love to talk a little bit about that you know sure. if, if it interests you because i do mentor a lot of business owners, not just attorneys on this particular subject, um, but just spe specifically in reference to, you know, personal time versus work time. You know, I have no problem telling a client, you know, I'm here in the office till six o'clock, that's business hours, please contact me tomorrow or I will get back to you at nine or 9.30 tomorrow. Um, and I have people from the community that are texting me all the time. Hey, I got a traffic ticket Hey, my kid got in trouble. Uh, hey, can you help out with this, that, or the third? And I say, you know, now I'm off. This is off office hours. Mm -hmm. and I'd love to be able to help you, but we're going to do that tomorrow. And I think that a lot of times people have a hard time doing that. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm hearing from you is that if you if you learn how to re-put the boundaries down, right, that we once had, you'd be able to, um, in many ways, accomplish different diverse things because you're not going to let everything bleed into everything else. You'll actually pull, put the boundaries on different aspects of your life. Exactly. And I think managing expectations is a big part of that, whether mm -hmm. it's a, a coworker or a boss, which may be harder, especially, you know, in my position as the business owner, maybe a little easier for me to do that than the average person. But, you know, you set that expectation at the beginning. I'm very reachable during the day. Mm -hmm. Of course, if there's an emergency, you can text me or whatever the case may be. Uh, or you can call the office and the answering service will pick up the call and then that will be forwarded to my cell. But, um, you know, outside of that, I think for a lot of times people, for some people, like everything's an emergency, you know, right. oh, I've got to re reach you about this thing. But I think probably 99% of the time it really isn't. Um, right. But yeah, we do have an emergency line. If people call in, they can hit a certain number on the voice prompt and then, you know, they get to a live operator and, and you know, they can leave their message there and that gets flagged. So talk to us a little bit about this business structure thing that you referenced. How, how do you advise, is it business owners and entrepreneurs or whoever it is in terms of how to structure their business in order to help, I guess, get more done? Yeah, so I am a tremendous proponent of the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. You've probably sure. heard of it. Of um, for me, that caused a tremendous shift in thinking and structuring my business. And essentially, the, the hallmarks of his particular philosophy are delegation and systemization. And unfortunately, one of the most challenging things for some people is delegating things to other people, uh, you know, just to even set up this interview, right? It wasn't Charlie Harari that emailed me, it was Charlie's assistant that emailed mm -hmm. me. And that's much more efficient because then Charlie could do other things that Charlie wants to do, right? right. So it's the same type of thing. If I'm able to delegate and have other people that help me out with certain other things, then that can free me up to do some of the passion projects, right? That we've talked about at the beginning of the interview. Um, and then systemization, you know, every business really can be systematized. It really is the mantra. 
And uh, if a person gets to the point where things run as systems, then things just become a lot more efficient. And it's not just like, oh, what am I doing? You know, how do I do this? Oh, I have to remember, I have to reinvent the wheel every single time. And, uh, you know, that's something that can really help. And it, it doesn't matter whether you're the business owner or not. You can make, let's say you're an employee, you can make a system for your job and you can, you know, create certain systems for how things are supposed to run and be and make them more efficient. Right. It's interesting you say that. And I think it's a very wise piece of advice that I want to sort of rest on for a minute. Um, when, when, you, when you think of your life as a system in many ways, right? Even if not all of life, even if it's 10% or 20% are things that you do consistently or problems that keep on coming up or ways that you'd like to do something. What I'm hearing you say, which I think applies to people in their businesses and in their lives, which is if you develop systems and you engage other people, you're going to find that you can take parts of the things that you're doing every day, give it to somebody else to do, and it, it'll still work and that'll free you up. But you have to look at the world from a perspective of, wait, if I'm doing it consistently, why don't I think about turning it into a system and having somebody else help me with it? Right, 100%. And I think Judaism and the Torah really tells us a lot about that. I mean, we have a structure to the day. We have the prayers we're supposed to do at certain times. You know, Shabbat comes on Saturday every week. It's not like, oh, next week, let's make Shabbat on a Tuesday oh, yeah. instead of on a Thursday. No, like it's, it's like clockwork. The holidays go according to a certain schedule. And even though there definitely is room to color within those lines, you know, and, and maybe two or two families may do certain things on Shabbat very differently, but there are other things that are just part of the system and you just can't decide in your own, oh, I'm just going to decide to make Shabbat on a Tuesday this week because I feel like it. Or, you know, Passover falls out, you know, right at the same time as the football season or whatever thing. And so I'm just going to do Passover the week before we're going to get it done. And next week I'll be free to, you know, attend the sports game or whatever. It doesn't so work like that. So let me, let me, let me keep on going down this, this path because this is fascinating. And I think it's so critical to hear it. And when you think time management, people don't necessarily take it this far. They think it's, I got what I got. Let me figure out how to you know, move the wheel, move the, the pieces around. It's like a Tetris game. And what you're saying is, wait, you can, you can go above the board over here. Um, but, but here's one thing that I want to ask you about, which is going to be people's blocks. It's, it's everyone's block, which is when I give it to you to do, you're not going to do it as well as me. Like I know how to do this and I've been doing this for so long. And that's why I can't do that because I'm doing this. And if I give it to you to do, you're not going to do it as well as me because you don't know as much as me. Maybe you're a, a, a new intern. Maybe you're younger than me. Maybe you're a different family member than I am, right? You're not better or worse, but I know how to do this thing. So how do you coach people to be okay with a product that's not going to be as good as the person to have them recognize that but the time that they get is, is more valuable? Yeah, so I get that all the time. And certainly as a senior person in the firm, being the founder of the firm, doing this for 15 years, you know, people call on me all the time, this question, that question, whatever the case may be. But yeah, if I didn't delegate and I didn't have associates and assistant support staff, people in different countries doing stuff for me, you know, clearly there are going to be deficiencies that come up. But I think really a lot of that, first and foremost, boils down to ego. And I'm sorry to say, maybe it's like a therapy thing, you know, a person needs to, Very because good. at the end of the day, to think that you are indispensable, irreplaceable, you're the best, you're the smartest, nobody can do it as well as you. I think to some degree, that might be an ego problem. That's number one. Right. And once a person gets over that and realizes, well, maybe that's actually not true. Maybe I just hired a person that's actually smarter than me, quicker than me, and can do something even better than me. And I want to tell you something. There are people in this office that have a better conversion rate than me on the phone. And people call up and we do that, you know, we do the pitch and whatever. And I, I think I'm a great salesman. I spend a lot of time, I've spent a lot of time honing that craft, but there are definitely attorneys in this office that do it better than me. Mm -hmm. And when I brought them in, they didn't know anything. And I trained them from scratch and we had meetings and trainings and all these types of things. So I think a lot of that is learning to put your own ego aside. And then the second piece of it is what I call, you know, sometimes good enough is just good enough. And I think uh, for some people that are perfectionists, it's much more difficult for them to be able to get over that. But if you're not a perfectionist, which I think is probably a good percentage of people, then it's really just about trying to make peace with the fact that, you know, maybe, maybe it's not going to be exactly perfect. You know, maybe there will be a mess up or something like that, but most of the time it's not going to be catastrophic. And not only that, a lot of times the other people won't even know, you know, you may be a bigger, bigger critic, the biggest critic of your people's work than anybody else who's gonna come into contact with them. 
All of that being said, you need to have quality people. You can't have somebody that's representing your business, uh, any, you know, that that's just going to be reflect poorly on that. So you do have to make sure that you have good people. But I think it was Ronald Reagan that said, I always thought to surround myself with the best, brightest, smartest people and delegate. Yeah. So, and, and, and just so we can bring it not only past the business world into, the, into one's personal life, because um, as I'm hearing you speak, it's, it's resonating, which is when, you, when we get past ourselves and we realize that my standard may not be this standard and we hire the right people, but you threw something else in there that I think was so important that we just pause on, which is you, you took your time and you trained somebody else. Meaning you, you spent time helping somebody else learn something that they didn't have when they got into your world. And that is such an important piece because you can have the best person in the world, but if they don't know what they're doing because the person on top doesn't have the time for them, isn't honing them and, and, and growing them, then they won't deliver. And I feel this is not only important for people that are involved in business, it's also people involved in their personal lives. You know, sometimes there are people in our personal lives that are not delivering the, re the results that we'd like, not because they don't want to be helpful, because they don't know what to do. And many times we have, we're, we're, we're too busy to train people and to teach people. And so we think it's because we're too busy, but we don't realize that the time you spend investing in someone else will ultimately pay back dividends in the future. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And I also want to add that I think a lot of that also is trying to give people the confidence, if they don't have it already, that they can be independent and they can do it. I mean, think about parenting, right? It's almost like the parent that's sitting there helicoptering over the kid. Oh, no, no, you color this way. Or, oh, you do the assignment that way. Right? We don't want that. Ultimately, we want our kids to be able to be independent. So we provide them the training. We send them to school. We role model. We show them what it means to be a good person, to be a good Jew. But really what we want is we want them to be independent. And so I think that that's really what it's like here. You do good training and ongoing training and you, your doors, our doors are always open for questions, et cetera. But ultimately we want people who can swim. Once we teach them how to swim, they can swim on their own. Um, and then we just give them the, we invest in them at the, at the front end, which is what you're talking about. But ultimately if we've done a good enough job hiring, screening, hiring, training, then ultimately these are people that are going to be able to work independently and we're not going to have to babysit them. We're not going to have to helicopter them, which I think is also a big problem in the work in the workforce. It's really, again, the ego, the perfectionism. I got to, you know, look at every single thing this person is doing. Not, not a single shred of paper is going to go out of this office without my review and my okay and my initials. I think that that's, that's crazy. I mean, why hire people if you're going to micromanage them? You know, right. it makes no sense. So. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. These tips were really, really invaluable. And I think that if people start to see this way and think this way, like you said, in the, when I, we, we began our interview, I have, you know, I'm, I'm, I have more time than you think, or I, I have more board time than you think. And now I think people can understand why, because if you build the systems right, you'll be able to have higher quality time. And we thank you for your insights and being part of the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. For more content, like and subscribe, and be sure to tune in live every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern at theshabacho.com or right here on YouTube.